One of my favorite relational passages in all of the Bible is actually the introduction to Luke. It's very unique if you take a second just to read the first four verses. And it's actually the first four verses are the sole reason we even have the Gospel of Luke if you take time to think about it. Let me read it uh, for us. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, it might be hard to catch, but those before Luke are two things. Do you, you notice that? They, they slapped them together, so it's hard, hard to see them. But the, they're eyewitnesses of the word, which is they're, they're eyewitnesses of Jesus. But then these same people do not remain bystanders. They become ministers, and they begin to teach and share the gospel of Jesus. Like, they can't um, hold back. And so I uh, want to focus in on eyewitness accounts for this morning. Um, culturally, back then, um, they would be culturally accurate and reliable. I think when we look at eyewitnesses today, we go, maybe, right? We have a, we have, we're not so sure, right? And it's, honestly, we would struggle with it today because we live in the information age. We are bombarded with so much information and we're disconnected from the truth because with the word narratives, for example, uh, we really have so many narratives that have no accountability, no reliability, uh, but also they, they just also don't even have eyewitnesses, right? It's just said on the internet and we assume it came from somewhere, but it's just said, right? And we've kind of maybe stumbled upon these ourselves or lost track of them. Honestly, when I was in youth ministry, I'm guilty of this. When Wikipedia came out, all the kids were like, we're going to use this for homework now. And I just showed them how easy it was to manipulate it. So I edited a few things myself. <laughs> Elephants are now pink. And it was verified on Wikipedia for a time period, that is. But um, I just showed them. It's like, guys, we can change things now. Um, it's, it's dangerous, the information age that we kind of live in. Um, so you cannot read this passage today with today's context and today's uh, understanding kind of just overlapped on top of it. For a great example, it uses the word narrative. And we use the word narrative completely different of what they meant when they said the word narrative. It just means account. It just means we're, we're writing down the account of what happened. Uh, we would question memory and motivation of accounts, though. And uh, when you live in a dominant oral culture, everything was already held to such a high standard that it being spoken was already verified. It was already a standard. R.C. Sproul talks about how Luke has already been under centuries, centuries of scrutiny by historians and has passed. It's gotten the official seal sign on it. Um, good to go. Yet today, we'd be like, uh, we don't even think about that, and we just think like a simple Google search, how to disprove Luke, we'd find something immediately, like, ah, oh, there we go, we're good to go, right? And that's how we treat a lot of our truth and understanding, is we just Google, <laughs> Google it first thing on Google, oh, it's, it says this, well, that must be true, it was number one in the search, right? Um, there's a historian, his name is Mitchell Ramsey, he set out to disprove, disprove Luke, that was his main goal. He was like, I'm tearing this thing apart, and I'm going for it. And he went on a journey going through. He followed Paul's journeys, looking at everything. Um, he studied Luke and then studied the physical evidence. And every time he looked and found something, it was verified and authenticated. Every time, and eventually through the process, he just became a believer because of all the visual evidence every historical aspect that he challenged, authenticated as true. So the part I want to highlight is that there were eyewitnesses. That we can see when Luke is trying to study and saying, I'm trying to bring these together, he went to the eyewitnesses. Now, Luke himself was not a disciple of Jesus, so he's coming from the outside wanting to understand. Um, and what he discovered is that something was accomplished among us. 
It, a visual display was given for there even to be an eyewitness account. They saw something, and it was visual, visible. They saw it. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is an examination, a testimony of the visible, uh, what is seen. And what is, what's the purpose of that? It's so that his friend may have what? Certainty. He wants his friend, for everything that he's being taught, I want you to have certainty over the things that are being taught. When you, when you go to church, we want, as you're taking time to read God's Word, we want you to walk with certainty over the things that you're being taught, that our faith may carry an assurance. Now, faith in what has already been seen is not faith. It's just certainty. It's just confirmation. It's not an actual faith. The Gospel of Luke is meant to give certainty in what the Gospel teaches us so that its reader is changed and moves towards a new life in Christ. So faith takes on a form of trust that will take us into what happens next. It's based on the promises and evidence given before. And our faith is confidence in what we hope for. So how do we get confident in order to have hope? Well, we can look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created. How do we know that? It was by the word of God. So it's, faith has both directions. It's both future and past. They, they both go together, and God provides both things. Um, but here's, here's how amazing this is. Our life experience demonstrates this. It demonstrates that we're given the ability to study past accounts. We're able to study experiences but also we're given, visually, we're given examples. We're given um, things that we can examine visually. So we, we may have reasoning and confidence. That's what we need in, in, in order to have the ability to trust something. When you want to trust, you, you have to have both of those things, reasoning and confidence. And trust moves us then into a future able to function, handle complexity, take risks, and move with God. If you ever feel like you're stuck, like, I just don't feel like I can move forward in my life right now, it's because you're lacking one of these two things, confidence or reasoning. You're struggling to trust, and that just kind of keeps us like, I, I can't see the future. I can't see where this is going. Art Zerdia uh, has this quote, totally love it. Um, it actually comes out of a song, so it's kind of like a, like a rap, per se, but not really. But I'm not going to rap it this morning, okay? Uh, but I'll read it like this. Faith is not a call to believe in things when common sense tells us not to. Faith is not a mindless stab in the dark. It's not a crossing of the fingers and hoping for the best. It's not a leap into apparent nothingness. It's a word that speaks of reasoned, careful, deliberate, intentional thought. Thought about what? God and His promises. It is to look at God and see the visual bread trail, the breadcrumbs that have us arriving at the certainty that his words match his actions, that his visual actions assure us of his continual promises. You think about it, do you want your faith to be stronger? Would you like your faith to be stronger? Then all you need to go and do is look at where's the object of your faith. Is it back on God's word and what he said? Or is it wishful thinking? That Luke is saying that the people he investigated, he noticed there was a change because of their faith. You catch that? They're eyewitnesses, but then they became ministers. They carried the thing that they saw. They were eyewitnesses of it, and they visually saw the Word of God in action. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus, and this changed them. Uh, Hebrews actually starts off very similar in this sense. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. We are given this visual and visible confirmation of what was being said before. It's whom He appointed the heir of all things, be Christ, through whom also He created the world. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, this is the crazy aspect of what God has done here. Before Jesus, we had the confirmation of God's word through prophets. But then, as soon as we have Jesus, we have confirmation of what he said before and new confirmation. But it's, everything before Jesus, I'm going to use this word, it's called reflection. Everything that we have to understand or any kind of confirmation that we have is only reflection. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, we saw the spoken word of God, but it was given through us through prophets. A prophet uh, would be, del- that's something that's delivered through us what was made in the image of God. A man is made in the image of God, M- made as the correct word here. Man only resembles what it was formed from. It's not exact though. On top of that, our eyes, our nature can only see what's created. So God is not made, is he? Is he made? Everybody's my kids. They always like, when was God made? When was he created? And they're like, try explaining that to them. He wasn't. He just exists. He's always exists. He's not a creation. He's the creator, right? He's a hundred percent pure, holistically supernatural. And the Bible refers to God as light. It uses light as an example for us to understand. Light is not something that you can actually see. Can you actually even stare at true light? I mean the sun. You stare for about like one second, maybe, and then your eyes, they're shot for the rest of your life, right? Don't look at it, right? But you can see Light, sort of. Can we see light? No, we see the reflection of light. Everything is light bouncing off other things, and that what gives us the effect of light, but it's all a reflection. It's all diffused light. And so we can only see diffused reflections. We can only see the effects of God. That's what the Bible means when it says God is light. You can, God is, exists. You can see the effects of him, but you cannot see him. That is until what happens? Until Jesus was born, who is not a reflection, but what? What does the scripture say? He's the radiance. He's the radiance of God. He is the source. He is the exact imprint of God because he is not made in the image of God. He is the image of God. So when we try to understand and think about this, this Christmas, is that we have a visible image of God that we can look to and look upon. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, as Colossians tells us. And this is why then in John it says that no one has ever seen God except through the Son. Only the Son has seen the Father who has the closest relationship with the Father and then has made him known. And then this is why Jesus tells us, right? If you've seen me, you've seen what? You've seen the Father. This is why Jesus tells us, look at me, I'm that exact print. You're looking at him. What's so amazing about this is that the image of God then came down to us. No longer like a bright sun that we can stare at only one second, right? Right? Or like when Moses says, I want to see your glory, God. And he's like, I got to put my hand over your eyes because there's no way you're going to be able to look at me. But instead, Jesus lowers himself and he provides for us an opportunity to see a visible image of what our God looks like. And the, the biggest thing that he gives us is the example and understanding of his character and then his attributes what was invisible, but the effects were seen. We saw those effects of God, but now we're seeing them firsthand in God himself in a way that we have never seen before. And we will never see again until Jesus returns. We'll never see the true visible image outside of Jesus. So God lowered himself. He took on our form. He carried the fullness of God's truth, of God's goodness, of God's love, mercy, and justice to give us then a visible image so that our certainty may also be relational. We don't just have a factual understanding of God. We now have a relational understanding of God. God made himself visible was not random. You ever thought about that? It's not random. He didn't decide on a whim. 
I feel like I just want to give them this visual example of me, this visible, I know I'm, I know I'm hidden from them, but I just want to show them. I think I'll just do it this week. It's, it's not like that. It's fulfilling. And that's the big key. The reason that God has made a visible image for us is because it fulfills everything that he spoke and promised. And it gives us hope like we never had before. So Luke begins his account with John the Baptist when he starts. When he says, I want to give you certainty, he starts not with Jesus, but he starts with John the Baptist. What's up with that? Uh, He's actually the only gospel to include the origin of John the Baptist. And what Luke is doing is he's setting up the return of God's word. He's not just setting up, here's Jesus, let's look and study him as a man. He's saying, this is the return of God's word and here's where it starts. Because right before John the Baptist, it had been 400 years since anyone had heard of the word of God. Anyone had heard anything new from God, it had been 400 years of silence. No, no prophets, nothing, silent until now. And so John the Baptist is ushering in God's word fulfilled. Everything that had come before, it, it begins to start now being fulfilled. But also, it's then God uh, present with us. He's ushering that in. You're going to start to see now this visible image come to be here. And so Jesus is like being announced, like a king. When a king comes into town, there's always someone that comes in before and says, get out of the way. Here comes the king. Stand to the sides. Get ready. Be prepared. And John is preparing the way for the Lord. He's alerting the people. He's offering them hope. And so you think about it. If you had someone come into your town and say, the king is arriving. Stand back. Get ready. Be prepared. What are you going to do? You're going to stand back. Maybe out of confusion, but everyone else is doing it. Right? But you're going to stand there. What are you going to do? You're going to hope. You're going to anticipate. You're going to wait. You can't see. You can't see him yet. You're going to sit and wait. And with this certainty of hope, this is John's birth. It's setting this up. It's a fulfillment of God's promises as well, though, for us. So in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. First off, in that statement right there, they would have been carrying at that time period a lot of shame in both of them for not having children. A priest was required to be married to an Israelite. There was a requirement for that. Why? To pass along the priesthood. And people held the view that God would then bless all faithful priests with children. And so you think about that for a second. Both of them, it says right there, they, they're righteous before God, meaning they're being faithful, and they're walking blamelessly, and yet barren, no children. What, what's going on? Why, why has God not blessed us? And so how can they pass on the priesthood uh, along the same as the Levites has done? The, they're supposed to be a caretaker of God's word, and they know they cannot, outside of their own life, continue to care for it unless they can pass it down. So there's this great sense of shame. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the customs of the priesthood, He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And while the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, no kidding, uh, and fear fell upon him. Uh, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. So there's that's a sign that they had been praying this whole time for a child. Your, Your prayer has been answered. They have been hoping. 
and you will have joy and gladness, says the angel, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, but, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So John the Baptist is, this is kind of crazy if you think about it, John the Baptist is the only one ever to be filled with the Holy Spirit at conception, right? Before Pentecost, I don't know what happens after Pentecost, I can't say, but at this particular point, it's so unique. It's so unique how God is divinely present here. And he's, God is present with John the Baptist in a way that you and I have access today, but no one else truly had access like John the Baptist did. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now, this whole passage right here, these words evoke many of the things God has already spoken, and that Zechariah would be very familiar with. Okay, for example, I'm just going to highlight two one, two of them: Isaiah 43, which also you can find in Matthew 3. But it's for this, for this, he who has who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, "The voice of the one crying in the wilderness." So we know this is where John's ministry ends up. He ends up in the wilderness, and he ends up talking to people and baptizing people. But he will prepare the way of the Lord, making his path straight. But my favorite is Malachi. This Malachi is how the Old Testament ends. It ends with these verses. There are no other verses outside this point. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Book closed. That's it. That's the end of the Old Testament. This promise that Elijah will come, and then here comes John the Baptist in the power and spirit of Elijah, and he's come to restore father and children. So right before this, though, my favorite is the verse right before that actually says, but what you need to do in order for destruction not to happen is you, you've got to hold to my word. You've got to hold to my commands. Look to my law. Remember my word, says God. Rely, cling to the certainty of my word. Remember, I have made this promise. Here it comes. But then silence. These are the last words for 400 years. Now, Zechariah said to the angel, here's how he responds, How shall I know this? What? How shall I know this? Because he just told you the fulfillment of all of Scripture. That's why he's a priest. He, he meditates on the Word of God. He, he should know that he's going to carry it. He wants a child in order to carry it on. He should know what the Word of God was going to say. For I am, I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in his years. As if you didn't know. What he's saying is old people don't have babies. That's what he's saying. You, you might be confused at how it works down here. Right? But he's telling him, he says, he's saying is, the certainty I have on the way the world works in the future that I know is greater than your certainty, is greater than the certainty of the Word of God. Okay? Now, the angel said to him, oh boy, I am Gabriel. Okay? I, I, I can just kind of see the, the, like the, just the bass come out of the angel's voice, right? I am Gabriel. Gabriel just means I'm a messenger of God. The Hebrew origins uh, from the word, by the way, garbar, which means strengthened one. I am the strengthened messenger of God. Gabriel. The angel's not speaking of his own fruition. Not saying, any, hey, this came to mind just to tell you. He's not saying any of that to Zechariah. He's not paraphrasing. He's not relaying information. He is only given permission. He's only strengthened to say the words of God. This is the verse. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. We only stand in reflection 
of God. I stand in the presence of God. I see the fullness of His glory. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. He is only strengthened to say the divine words of God here. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the days that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So Zechariah does not lose his voice as a random punishment. I feel like that's me going, you've lost TV for a week. How does TV even connect with anything that was going on? This connects greatly. He is basically saying it's very much connected to the issue, and it's, in fact, for Zechariah, it's the spiritual growth needed for him. Zechariah has been praying, and he has been hoping, but what he's been doing is he's been praying and hoping without certainty. Because he's hoping, he's just wishful thinking. I wish I had a kid. God, I just, why I wish I had this. Rather than relying on God. Why does he want a kid so bad? Because he doesn't feel blessed. Because he knows he's supposed to be caretaker of the word of God. And even if a child never came, God could provide both of those things for him. But he's wishful thinking, saying, this is how it's going to be. I want these things. Why? Because everyone else had them. This is a certainty, isn't it? I'm just wishful thinking here. He'd been wishing while doubting, hoping, but never trusting. Okay? And he, he, and, and he comes to it. He, he arrives. All this arrives. Here it is, this moment. Prayer's answered, and he's like, mm, correction. I don't think you know how it works around here, angel. He does not remember the Word of God. Lost sight of it completely. He studies the Word of God, and he walks away from it and completely forgets. Right? He, he has no certainty in God's promises. He's just going about his life and his day. So now Zechariah is not allowed to speak into what God is doing. That's the punishment. The punishment is you have to sit back and watch me work is what God is saying. He's left in a constant state of certainty. Every time that he tries to speak, what will he be reminded of? Oh, I'll be reminded that God <laughs> fulfills his promises. I'm reminded of what God is doing here. This is like Jacob going and wrestling with God. Jacob doubts God, struggles with God. He has an encounter with God and they wrestle. And God is basically saying, it's okay to wrestle with God to have doubt, but what will happen? You most likely will lose a hip. If you choose to engage with God in this way, He's going to take out your hip. He's going to take it for Himself. So watch out. But that's a good thing, because every day that Jacob walked around after that, and the ache and pains of, not, of his hip being destroyed, he's reminded, what? I wrestled with God. I had an encounter with God Almighty. So anytime that he ever doubted again, he was reminded, oh no, there is a God. I'm, I remember. Don't wish for, like, I just need a daily reminder. Don't, I don't recommend wishing for it. I, I would recommend looking back and seeing how God has worked this whole time. But if you need it, all right, go ahead and pray for it. <laughs> Zechariah is now daily reminded uh, that we can have certainty in God's word. Why? Because he knows that the moment that he'll be able to ever speak again is when everything that God said will be fulfilled. So now, what does he have? Now he has hope, right? Now he has a certainty of hope that he looks forward to the day he will get to speak again. But now he has time to think about how he will speak, right? And there's a difference between the way we spoke before. He spoke with certainty about himself, and now he will speak about certainty that he has in God. How will he use his voice? Will he speak of his eyewitness account that he had? Will he share it with others? Will he testify to what God is doing, what God has done? Or will he be like, yeah, it's good, back to normal now. Don't have to worry about it anymore. Back to, oh, I'm so glad to get back to the way things were. <laughs> Man, what a fool if he were to do that. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. What's going on? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision 
in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. This is very similar to the disciples' battle with hope. They walked with the visible image of God. And then when Jesus ascended, they now had to carry the visible image with hope. With certainty, though, in the form of hope. And the hope hung on the promises that Jesus declared. He said, it's going to be better for me to leave. It would be better that I go. I'm preparing a place for you. And now they had to hang on those words. They had to rely on those words, that there was good news in his death and resurrection, and that it was meant to be shared, but also that there was certainty in all that God had done before. They could look back and see, look how much Jesus has fulfilled. Let's teach this. Let's share this good news. So after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived... And for five months, she kept herself hidden. So she's not going out in public. But while she's hidden, catch this, she is saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach or my disgrace among people. Five months. She's hidden for five months. She didn't walk out to the people, and everyone said, why, Elizabeth, you're pregnant. You're no longer living in shame. Good for you. She's hidden, right? She's tucked away. She is with, by herself with Zachariah, hidden. And she's able to say then she has no more disgrace among people. She's hope, she has hope with certainty that she knows when she comes back out into public after the five months, she knows that she no longer has shame because her hope is in the Lord. You catching that? So like Elizabeth, like Zechariah, and like the disciples, we have the opportunity to do the same, right? We can engage in hope. We can engage hope with certainty in all that we have been taught. We, we have the evidence, like uh, Theophilus has. We have authentication of the visible. There is plenty enough research that you can go and find and get authentication. We have the Word. We have the Word of God, but we also have the effects of the light. We can look around and see the evidence of God, but we also have our own pasts. We have our own experiences um, that if we were to reflect, as we should, we should all, as Christians, we should be good at practicing, reflecting on what God has done before, because that is literally what the Bible is teaching us to do. Um, We could see how God has been present this whole time. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take that far back to look. That's why I always loved in youth ministry, they always said, go go write down a prayer journal. Just write down a prayer journal and you'll see how God has been answering prayers this whole time. It's not that hard to go back and look and see how God has been there. But the problem is, is we would rather hope for things that we have seen, not have hope in things that are not seen. So we have a terrible tendency to live moment to moment to allow our current emotions to determine what is true and what we hope for. What we we do, we chase experiences. I have a great experience with God. That was great. And now a day has passed. I need another one, right? It only satisfies for a moment. We want only what we can currently see and what we can currently feel. But the problem with experience is they both have a beginning and an end. (laughs) That's the point of an experience, right? We just want to coast right here in the middle, that middle part, just to last forever, right? Uh, we, We could have hope with certainty, though, that allows us confidence to push into the future. But I think you and I both know that requires work, and that we don't like to do, right? We want reasoning and certainty, but reasoning and certainty, it requires reflection on what God has said and what God has done. Jesus in in Scripture tells us that He is the hope of all nations. That when Jesus comes for the very first time, our hope is in such a new way that we have never experienced before. But Jesus still said 
it's better for me to go than to stay. Because it's going to help us require on hoping for things we could not fathom. The culture around us is, is trying to create a utopia. But what they're really doing, and they don't realize what they're doing, they're trying to create the glory of God, the presence of His full glory, visibly. We're try, trying to take the invisible God and make Him visible without Jesus. And we're trying to live in that. And if we can't have that, then we destroy utter destruction of all else. Okay, so the, the problem is, is that when we don't look to Jesus, we don't see the visible image given to us so that we may hope and be in that future of the true fullness of glory of the visible image of God. See, Jesus, He is our hope. You and I don't get to see Him today like the disciples did. I think we're in a better spot than they were. He is redeeming us as children of God. It's not something that you can see. It's something you understand. And we can put our hope in Him. And one day, we will be in that full, visible image of His glory. But we have to do this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we are given this access to God, this closeness with God, and we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption uh, to sonship to be children of God, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. This hope of Jesus. What Jesus has done and prepares a way for us, this is where we're saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Church, we, we have to start practicing anticipation, but we have to do so with confidence, with reasoning and assurance.